Hello, Rolf. Perfectly. How are you? All right. How are you doing, Rolf? How are you? How's everything going? Oh, going, going, going. Just finished a little job. Oh, that's very, very nice. nice. Good, 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 good. That's very good news, Baruch Hashem. Like, like manna from heaven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> today, today, every job, everything is a manna of heaven. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, Ooh. today we can't be fussy. We can't be fussy, you know. You know how I things go in. Yeah, I just want to get this name for you, Rabbi. Just hang on. Okay. Can, okay. Rolf, yes. can we add it on? Uh, can you add it onto your list? Yes. Sara Rivka, but you who did. Sara Rivka, but you did. I have it. You got it on the good. I have it for a long time on the list. Yeah. Ah. That's Shirley. Shirley. Yes, Shirley. Yeah. 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 I have it for a long time. Yeah, you know they uh, they in, they in the complex now. Ah, uh, really? Yeah, they moved in. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah. Okay. Very very nice. How she's doing? She doing better? No. <coughs> no. Uh, no. No. Oh, Marky with us. Hello, Marky. Hey, Rob. <laughs> oh, oh Marky. My, my, hey. my, yes, my little <laughs> boy is waving. Hey. How are you, Mark? Good well, Louis, hello, Adam. Hello. Adam. Hi, Rabbi. Adam how, is, uh, how are you? Let's see who else with us. I want to see who else with us. I see Frank with us. Hello, Frank. Oh, hey, Rabbi. with us. Stephen with us. Isaac with us. Good. Good. Okay. Good. Okay. So we're getting there. Okay, so I think that we're going to start the show because uh, we're usually waiting for Dr. Les, but obviously Dr. Les will take a few minutes because I think it's with the Kumsitz, and the Kumsitz soon going to be finished. So, um, um, so we're going to start the show without any further notice. I would like to dedicate the show in Na'ana on the soul of אסתר קדן בת קציה, מורדכי בן רחמה, הרב אברהם חיים בן אליעזר יעקב, תמר בת זהבה, רחל בת מלכה סולטנה יעקב סלומון בן פרחה, דבורה רות בת בלה, חיים אליהו בן ישעיהו, השם ינקום דמו. אליהו, בן, אליהו דוד בן אברהם, השם ינקום דמו, מלכה רג'ינה בת ג'ויה. Please God that the show will lift up the soul. Um, now we're going to dedicate the show in help of Liora Bat Miriam, Menashe Naji Ben Faha, Orna Bluma Bat Miriam, Harav Avraham Ben Marina, Rav Shlomo Yehuda Ben Dalia, Rav Moshe Ben Devora, Eitan Gabriel Ben Shulamit Aviva, Avraham David Ben Sara Gito, Dvora Bat Esther, Baracha Bat Malbika Chadok Ben Sara Shulamit Bat Haya Shein Alea, Sara Rivka Bat Yehudit, Shmariyahu Ben Batya, Shayna Kayla Bat Hana Mordechai David Ben Lea Veleiv HaKohen Ben Elisheva Please God, Refua Shleima to them and to all Amo Yisrael. So we're going to start the show. I'm going to mute everyone. And, uh, and then before we start, Louis, you just unmute yourself. So we're going to do introduction to the Parsha. In a previous Parsha, the Torah commands us to build a tabernacle. That's me. A protocol Bet Mikdash. The first thing that Akadosh Baruch Hu now commands us in our parsha is to take olive oil. That means to bring olive oil to light the menorah. Also, that he commands us that the menorah must light from the evening to the morning. That there is a command that the menorah must be lit from the morning to the evening. Also, Akadosh Baruch Hu. Uh, a point that uh, told Moshe that he appointed Aaron to become the Kohen Gadol to serve in a tabernacle. 
not only that, he told Moshe Rabbeinu that he have to appoint the son of Aharon, that they will serve as the Kohanim, and they are Nadav and Avihu, Elazar and Itamar, the fourth son of Aaron Akohen. Akadosh Baruch Hu command and tell Moshe Rabenu that the priestly clothes have to be four kind of priestly clothes for the normal Kohanim, while the Kohen Gadol have to have a five the, another four different garments. So that's mean the Kohen Gadol in total have to wear eight, while the normal priests have to wear four. Okay, HaKadosh Baruch Hu command Aharon that they must, <clears throat> that they must make special four clothes, obviously for the Kohen Gadol, because he have to wear the four. After that, the Torah tell us something very interesting is the ceremony of appointing and anointing the Kohanim and the Kohen Gadol, by that, that you anointing the Kohanim with the oil, with a special oil that called Shemen Amishah. After that, you have to bring certain sacrifice for the second day and to uh, spring water on top of the Mizbeah, to sparkle water on the Mizbeah. Right in the end of the parsha, the Torah speak about the special altar, the altar Mizbeah Hakitoret. Basri Mizbeah Hakitoret. It was a special Mizbeah that on that Mizbeah they used to sacrifice the spices. That they used to sacrifice twice a day the spices. And the command was that it must be, it must be plated gold. So now, Be'ezrat Hashem, Na'asev Na'atzliyah, Ve'ashem Alenu Be'rahama Ve'arviyah, we're going to start the show, Parashat Tetzave. Ve'ata Tetzave et Bnei Yisrael, Ve'yikhu Elecha Shemen Zayit Zach, Katit Lamaor, Le'alot Ner Tamid. Louis, unmute yourself. Yeah. Now you shall command the children of Israel that they shall take to you pure olive oil, pressed for the illuminations to kindle the lamp continuously. If you, there is, before we start, I think that we should say something very interesting, that one of the thing that all the commentaries that wrote commentary on our Holy Torah was wondering how come that in our Parsha, a name of Moshe Rabbeinu never mentioned. And today we're going to speak about it and we're going to try to explain what's happening that the name of Moshe is not been mentioned. We explained in previous show in one. So first of all, we have to understand, I'm just going to repeat it very, very briefly, and then I'm going to go into what I want to get to. After the incidents of the golden calf was a big anger in heaven. And uh, we know that Akadosh Baruch Hu was planning to destroy the entire, <clears throat> entire nation. That, <clears throat> sorry, the entire nation that actually <clears throat> was involved with the golden calf. Moshe Rabbeinu gone up to heaven and prayed to Akadosh Baruch Hu and asked Akadosh Baruch Hu for forgiveness, for atonement, for the sin of the golden cup. Hazal explained that when Moshe Rabbeinu was in, in, uh, up in heaven and the Torah tell us, Moshe Rabbeinu said to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Im ayin meheni na misifrecha, asher katafta. Let's mean Moshe Rabbeinu said to the Almighty, if you're going to destroy the Jewish nation, if you're planning to destroy the Jewish nation, please erase my name from your holy book. That's mean from the fat book of Moses. That's basically what it said there, okay? And Hazal said for that, that Moshe Rabbeinu said, he's been punished that his name not gonna be mentioned, okay? In the Torah in this parsha. But the Mepharshim asked, wait, we have to understand. Why Dafka Parashat Tetzaveh and not any other parasha? Why the name of Moshe Rabbeinu? 
been erased, not mentioned, not been erased, not been mentioned in Dafka and this parasha. We know that from the beginning of Sefer Shemot until, until the end of Sefer Dvarim, the name of Moshe mentioned in every book, except in this parasha. And the Mefarshim asked that question. So, how come Dafka in Parashat Tetzave, the name of Moshe Rabbeinu not been mentioned? So, Be'ezrat Hashem, I'm going to bring two different ideas why Dafka, the name of Moshe Rabbeinu, never mentioned in Parashat Tetzave. So, first of all, we have to understand that one of the ideas that the commentary bring, that we all know that Moshe Rabbeinu passed away on a Zayn Be'adar, the seven of Adar. Okay, Beshiva Beadar. Okay, what's happening in Zan Beadar? We all know that Moshe Rabbeinu born and he died and he passed away. Hazal said that there is a principle in our head that Zan Beadar always will fall, always will fall in a week that we read Parashat Betzaveh. Parashat Tetzaveh. So if it's fallen, it's come to tell us that you know why we're not mentioning Dafka and this parasha, the name of Moshe Rabbeinu, the Torah doesn't mention, it's to tell us that Moshe Rabbeinu on that week disappeared. That means he passed away and therefore his name not been mentioned in the parasha. To hint to us that remember, in Parashat Tetzaveh, in a week that you read Parashat Tetzaveh, Moshe Rabbeinu passed away, a reminder. Other idea is that the Mefarshim bring, it's from the words Misifrecha. That means, if you gonna destroy the nation, Misifrecha, im ein mehenina Misifrecha, what does it mean Misifrecha? From your book, and Pshat of the Barim, the, the Dvarim, Misifrecha, from your book. But the Mefarshim say, take, take the word misifrecha and split it to two words. What you're gonna do, you're gonna get misefer kaf. That means from the book, kaf, kaf, the gematria is 20. Hazal say, from here you learn that already, already Moshe Rabbeinu knew that in a 20th parsha, his name not gonna be mentioned. What does it mean? If you take the book of Sefer Bereshit, until from book of Sefer Bereshit and the book of Sefer Shmot, count 20 parshiot, 20 parsha are gonna fall, parashat tetzave. So it says, hazal, im ayin mehenina misifrecha. If not, don't mention my name. From what? From parsha number 20. So Hazal say, from here you learn something very interesting. You learn that, you know, what was the reason? What was the reason that the name of Moshe Rabbeinu never been mentioned, Dafka and Paratat, Tetzaveh? Number one is because Parashat Tetzaveh always fall, the design by Adar always fall on a week that we read Parashat Tetzaveh. Number two, it's from what Moshe Rabbeinu said, Misifrecha. Take the word Misifrecha, split it, it's going to be Misefer Esrim, Sefer Kaf, Kaf Gematria 20. That means that here Moshe Rabbeinu said that don't mention my name on book number 20. Okay, so now we understand why Dafka Parashat Tetzaveh, but we have to understand what's happening, why his name not really been mentioned because we know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu didn't destroy the Jewish people. So how come, how come the name of Moshe Rabbeinu not been mentioned? So uh, Hazal in uh, Zohar HaKadosh in page 175, folio two. Remember in Sefer Bereshit, book of Bereshit, the Zohar on a book of Bereshit, 175, folio two say, Hazal explained, that when a tzaddik, when a tzaddik says something, even that he doesn't really mean it, the word that he say, standing up, what does it mean? Hazal explained that when a tzaddik says something, 
when they when they mean the when the tzaddik curse, even if it doesn't have a specific meaning, and I will explain, that curse work. Okay, so how does it work? Has I explained that if you remember that when Yaakov Avinu left the house of Lavan, what happened? Rivka, uh, sorry, Rachel Imenu stole the idols, where she put it, under the cushion, and she sat on it. You remember? Lavan blamed Yaakov Avinu, you stole my idol. Lavan said, Yaakov Avinu said to Lavan, I don't know what you're talking about. What are you talking about? What idols? What are you talking about? Anyway, Lavan searched all over the camp. He'd gone from tent to tent. When he came to Rahel, she, we know the story that she told him that she cannot stand up. And anyway, so when he came again, Lavan to Yaakov, Lavan said to him, whoever gonna be this, the, the idol is gonna be with him, uh, he cursed him. And we know that shortly after that, Rahel Imenu passed away. So we learn from here, what is the message? There is here a Musa, a message for us, that the person have to be careful what he say. A person have to be careful what's coming out of his mouth, especially a person that is a tzaddik. If he's a tzaddik and he say, has shalom, if he curse, it can cause only problem. So Hazal say from here, you learn something extraordinary. You have to learn that you have to be so careful what's coming out of your mouth. Every word that you say and call Vahomer to a tzaddik, have to be careful. Even if you don't have a meaning, even if you don't meant it, you say it, the word have a lot of strength up in heaven. And sometimes, has v'shalom, that word that you say, catching up in heaven. So we have to be careful what are we saying and what's coming of our mouth. Okay, so now we understand why the name of Moshe never mentioned in the book of, in Parashat Tetzaveh, in the book of Shmuel. Now let's start with the parsha. Ve'ata Tetzaveh, a new. What does it mean, a new? And you should command. So I'm going to bring the idea according to the Musar idea, Ve'ata. What it means, Ve'ata, Hazal say, Kodem, Kol Tivdok Et Atzmecha. First thing, before anything, check yourself. What it means, check yourself. Before a person come to Pasken Alacha, before a person come to say something, he must check himself. He must check that what he's saying, he's 100%. Because it's not a hokmah to give a Musa and you yourself not following what you're saying. So what's the hokmah that you give Musa? Okay? Tetzaveh, only after you check yourself, you check the halacha, you check everything, then you say it. Okay? So there is here a number of ideas that Hazal explained. That number one, one of the ideas that Hazal explained, that when a person comes to give halacha, to pass in halacha, he must check all the opinion that there is and then to pass him. If you come to say something, you must make sure that what you're saying is correct. So now we understand what it means to Chave. But Hazal tell us in a Gemara in 107, folio 2. Listen what it says. Hazal says, What does it mean? Hazal tell us in a Gemara that before you come to say something to people, first of all, check yourself. Make sure that, that you have no wrong with what you're saying. That means if you come in to say something to someone, to give a Musa, check that that kind of a character trait doesn't applicable to you. That means that you are 100% with that. Otherwise, don't give Musa. Because Hazal tell us a beautiful, in a Gemara in, <clears throat> in a Gemara in Mastechet Baba Batra, in page 60, folio 2, Hazal give us a beautiful story about Rabbi Anai. Rabbi Anai was a stager, 
and he was a dayan. And two men come in for, for the Din Torah. They have a dispute between them and they come to Din Torah to Rabbi Yanai. And when they came, the two opposition, everyone say what he have to say. And the first person say, listen, the reason that I'm here because my neighbor's, my neighbor's tree, his branch coming over my property and it's disturbing and I would like him to cut it. The person say, it's not my obligation. Nahon, it's my tree, but it's over your wall. You must cut it. That was the argument. Rabbi Yanai listened to both of them and he said to them, listen, come tomorrow. Both of the guys were surprised. It's a very simple case. I mean, what, uh, what do we have to come tomorrow? It's just a very simple case. No, I will pass him for you tomorrow. Okay. After that, immediately Rabbi Yanai gone home, the Gemara said, and he gone to check his tree. That is his tree, the branch that coming from his tree facing public domain. When he gone and he saw that his tree, that the branches facing public domain, immediately he called someone to come and to cut the branches, not to disturb the public. Hazal said the following morning, when both of the people came to the Din Torah, he passed in that the person that owned the tree obligated to cut the the branches that going over his wall to his neighbor. Okay, the person immediately say, yeah, Rabbi, I accept it, but does your tree, if I'm not mistaken, your branch facing public domain, it's over the public domain. So how are you paskin that I'm obligated to cut when you don't cut it? So Rabbi and I said to him, listen, go and look. If my branch for my tree facing over the public domain, don't cut yours. But if my tree its branch not over the public domain, you must cut. Hazal come and teach us from here that before someone come and give orders, become paskin halacha, saying something, he must make sure that he check himself. And that's what Hazal <coughs> tell us in the Gemara in Basachet Baba Metzia in page 107, folio two. Keshot atzmach ve'acharkach keshot acherim. Before you order something, before you pass in a din Torah, make sure that you are hundred percent. And that's what it means with tetzave. Tetzave, before you order others, make sure that you perfect. Another idea for the word tetzaveh. If we take the word tetzaveh, Hazal say tzavta. What it means tzavta? Together. Hazal say that from the word tetzaveh, the Musa, uh, uh, the Musa rabbi explained that from the word tetzaveh, you can learn something extraordinary. What you can do. He said that when you want to come and you want to give order to people, you must be together. What does it mean? And I will explain. Hazal explained that when Moshe Rabbeinu came to ask Bnei Israel to give a donation to both the Mishkan and the Tebel Neko, what did he say to them? He said to them like this, come, let's go together, all of us, and put some money to both the Mishkan, the Tebel Neko. Hazal said, from here you learn that when a rabbi, when a Talmud Hacham want to say something to his student, he have to do it together with them. That means to get to their level, speak their own language. That means Hazal say from here that it's a tzetzaveh. That means that you have to do it together with a member, with your community, with your student. That means speak to them on a level that they feel like you're part of them without being any condensation between you and the student, between you and your congregation. So when Moshe Rabbeinu came to Bnei Israel and he said, Akadosh Baruch Hu command them, 
So when Moshe Rabbeinu came to Bnei Israel, he was with the act that he was together with them. That means that the Torah come to teach us that if you want people to listen to you, be part of them. Don't show that you over them, give them orders. Do it with them in the same level, speak with them. And then the people will listen to you. Although that you command them, they will listen to you. It's the way of speaking. That's what Hazal said. And then it says, But it means Bnei Israel. I saw a beautiful commentary that bring Rabbi Eliezer Papo. Rabbi Eliezer Papo, born in the city of Sarajevo in Bosnia, 237 years ago. And he said that the word Bnei Israel actually referring, you know to who? It's referring to Tinokot Shel Bet Rabban. What does it mean, Tinokot Shel Bet Rabban? Say Rabbi Eliezer Papo, it's referring to the youngsters in a Jewish religion. Who's that, the youngsters in a Jewish religion, in a Jewish nation? He explained that the little one, that when you come to speak to the Jewish people, speak first to the Jewish one with a way that they will understand you. Why? Because that's the future. And then it says, Vikhu. What it mean, Vikhu? That you must learn, that you must take people, you must speak to them gently. You must never be very firmly on Tinokotchel Bet Traban, the youngsters. That means that a rabbi, when he speak to the youngsters, you have to speak to them very gently. You mustn't be very firmly with them. He must speak to them like a friend. And that's how they will accept his words. So Hazal said, from here you learn, from here you learn something very interesting. You learn that Hazal tell you that when you speak to people, if you want to speak to them, okay, you have to speak to them very gently. Okay. So we see that until here was a Musa, how you should speak to people, how you should communicate with people. But the most important thing that you must check yourself. Then it said, now we come to the major thing, Hazal ah, said to us that the Torah said that you should bring shemen zayt zach katit maor. You should bring the olive oil, pure olive oil to light the menorah. Okay. In previous showroom, Rabotai, we explained how did they make that olive oil. I will repeat it very briefly. Hazal explained that people take the olive, and when they take the olive, the Torah meant that from the first crush, after you crush the oil, the first drop that come, that drop of olive oil, olive oil that you put aside and with that you're going to light the menorah. The rest of the oil you can do other things from that. But to light the menorah, miktisha rishuna. What it means miktisha rishuna? From the first time that you crush, you press the oil, the first drop that come out, that you put aside, okay? And with that you light the menorah. That's what we explain. I saw a beautiful question and now we're getting to the point that I saw that Rav Mordechai Eliyahu, Zecher Tzadik Vekadosh Livracha, asked. Rav Mordechai Eliyahu, born 93 years ago in Jerusalem. And he was the chief Sephardi rabbi in Israel uh, before Rav Amar. Okay? Sorry, before Rav... Uh, oh, I'm sitting on my tongue. Taridano, Rav Taridano. Not. Sorry, Arab? No. No, 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 no. It will come to me. It will come to me. It will come to me. He came to visit us here in South Africa. He came to visit us here in South Africa. He come to collect money for his uh, institute. Um, anyway, so say Arab Mordechai Eliyahu, you telling me that in a Torah, you're going to say, you telling me, Akadosh Baruch Hu command Bnei Israel that you should bring olive oil to light the menorah. Said, beautiful. But I want to ask a question that Mefarshim said. Where you find olive tree in the wilderness? 40 years, Ben Israel was in the wilderness. 
where are you going to find olive tree in the wilderness? You go up and down, north, south, east, west, search it. You're not going to find anywhere in the wilderness olive tree. Olive tree need a special condition, need to be watered. In the wilderness, uh, we know it's a very tough, very rough, extreme weather. Where they got the olive oil to light the menorah? No, Rabota, it's a very valid question. So, Arab Mordechai Eliyahu, Zecher Tzadik Vekadosh Livracha, said that he saw and he bring in the answer from Targum Yonatan. Targum Yonatan was Yonatan ben Oziel. Yonatan ben Oziel was the student of Hillel. Okay? Just before the second, before the destruction of the second temple, if they live. And Yonatan ben Oziel says something extraordinary. He say, you know, where's the oil came? Came from heaven. That's olive oil to light the menorah for 40 years in the wilderness came down from heaven. Immediately all the mefarshim, almost all the mefarshim, all the commentaries. So wait, how can you light the menorah from all of that came from heaven? Because the Torah commands us, Shemen Zaid Zach Katit Lamaor. Katit, remind me, I will explain, there is a secret behind that word. So explain the Mepharshim, what's happening here. That you can't light the menorah from heavenly oil. The menorah have to be light from oil that have to grow on a tree here on earth. So the Mepharshim say that here was Sha'at at Zorich, we allow. What does it mean? In a time of desperate, you can light with heavenly, okay, oil that made a miracle. So the Mefarshim say, and, and it came to me, that's my, my uh, commentary, my idea. You don't have to accept it. Where do we saw it also? We saw it in Hanukkah. When they find a small jar of oil, the oil was enough for one day, but the miracle happened that that oil lost for the rest of the seven day together for eight days. So if that was allowed, where do you learn that? You learn that from here. That Bishata Torah in a time of desperation, you can use miracle oil that came down from heaven. So why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu command them that mitzvah, you can ask? You can tell them when you enter at Israel, light the menorah there. Why to light the menorah dafka? In the tabernacle, what was so what was so important? He said the Mepharshim something extraordinary. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu knew that Bnei Israel are not going to find oil where? In the wilderness. Why? Because there is no olive tree. But he commanded them that Bnei Israel will learn the obligation and, and the chova that they had, that even when they enter to Eretz Israel, they will never say that we don't have to light the menorah. Why? Because when we was in the wilderness, we didn't have oil. No, it's Nishgafelach. No. Come the Mepharshim and say, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu specially command them that, and specially giving them oil from heaven. That from here they learn the importance of that the menorah should be lit in all the time. The importance that the menorah all the time gonna be lit in. Because without that, when they enter Eretz Israel and they build the Beit HaMikdash, ah, they're not gonna take it seriously. And that's what I wanted to connect Okay, to Hanukkah. That Bnei Israel, that the Jewish people in the time of the Hashmonaim done everything that they can do in their power to find pure olive oil that never been contaminated to light the menorah. And that's what that thing come to teach us. We say katit, and with that I'm gonna, I'm gonna end up 
the first verse, because I spend almost a half of the show on it, a half of the show. Hazal say, what it mean katit? So the Mepharshim explained, take the word katit. How you write katit? Katit, you write kaf, tet, yud, tet. Split the word to two, you get kat. What it mean kat? Gematria, 420. And the other word, you get yet. 410. He said, the Mepharshim say here, the Torah hint to us, the existence of each Bet HaMikdash. The first Bet HaMikdash was exist for 100, 410 years. Here it's a Yutet. Kaftet, it's come to tell you for the second Bet HaMikdash that was exist for 420 years. So the Torah come in the Parsha, tell us Pshat, Remez, Drash, Sod, and we done also the Musar behind all of it. So we're learning from here something very important, Rabotai. Let's summarize it. That the Torah come and tell us that when you come to give orders, especially orders, Tetzaveh, the word Tetzaveh, you come to tell people to do certain things. How you should do it? First of all, check yourself that you are 100%. And only then tell them. But also when you're telling them, doing it with a way that you, they're going to feel that you're part of them, that you're not only giving them orders and commanding them, that you're part of them. Let them feel that you're part of that command, that you're working with them hand in hand to do that. After that, the Torah tell us how you should do it what it means, how you should do it, especially when you speak to the youngsters, that when you speak to the youngsters, you should do it very, very, very. You have to do it in such a adinut, uh, so gentle that they're going to feel that you're not so firm on it. Then we explain that the Shem and Zayt, where did they go to Shem and Zayt? And if that's the case, that we're not allowed to have heavenly olive oil. How come that they use it? It's to teach us for the future. What does it mean for the future? For the two Bet Amigdash that we're going to be built in Eretz Israel, And the Torah tells us that they're going to be existing for a certain amount of years, and then they're going to get destroyed. And we're still waiting for the third Bet Amigdash. We'll speak about the third Bet Amigdash right, right in the end, in Aftar Abba Ezrat Hashem, today in the show. Let's move to verse 2. Uh, sorry. To chapter 28, verse 2. And in uh, verse 2, the Torah tells us, Tifaret. And you shall make a vestment of sanctity for Aaron, your brother, for glory and splendor. Okay. In this verse, we see that the Torah commands us that we should make a special clothes, obviously, for the Kohanim. But here is special that you should make a special clothes for who? For Aaron Kohen. And what to differ? We have to understand why is the clothes of the Kohen Gador different from the Kohanim? Why the, the normal priest compared to the heavenly priest, the clothes that they wear, they differ. So we explained at the beginning of the show, the normal Kohanim and Bet Amikdash wear four different clothes, okay? And the clothes that the normal Kohen wear, I have to just tell you that, that the normal Kohanim wear Ketonet. Ketonet is a, a haluk. Haluk is like um, a gown, okay? Migbat. That means that they have a long piece of material that they used to round it around the head, like a head that they used to make. And then Avnet, Avnet, it was a belt. And then they used to have pants, a, a garment. Okay. But then a Kadosh Baruch Hu come and command, okay, and tell Moshe Rabbeinu, tell Bene Israel that the heavenly priest must have another four kind of clothes. 
So what the Kohen Gadol have to wear is the ephod. What is ephod? Ephod is the apron, you know, the nice apron. Then the choshet, that the breastplate. And then the ma'il, that that's the coat. And then you have the tzitzah zahav. What it means, the tzitzah zahav? Tzitzah zahav is the, 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 the gold, uh, what you call it, tzitz. The gold uh, um, forehead plate, okay? The head, the head plate that the Kohen Gadol have to wear on his head. Okay, we understand that. Why is that? Why is it? So a beautiful commentary that brought by Rabbi Aharon Halevi. Rabbi Aharon Halevi born <clears throat> in a city of Gorondia. He born in a city of Gorondia in Spain. 787 years ago. And his book, Sefer Ahinu, in Mitzvah Tzadik Tetz, that means Mitzvah number 99, listen what he said. And he said like this, he said like this, HaKohen Hitztava, Lil Bosch Gadim Yuhadim, that means the normal, normal priest being command to dress with a special clothes, that when he look at them, he will understand, he will understand who is standing in the front of. That's me. That when a servant, normal Kohen, that servant Bet Amikdash, when he wear those four clothes, he must understand that he have a special duty. Okay? And who, and who he's standing in the front. So say from what Rabbi Aaron Halevi say, we're learning something important, Rabotai, something very, very important. And I'm going to bring an analogy. And the Havdil, the Havdil, the Havdil, the Havdil, a hundred thousand times. Okay? If you take a king, or if you take a judge, a policeman, whatever it is, they have to wear certain clothes that they represent whoever they represent. The king has to represent himself with nice clothes. To show that he's a king. A judge have to wear a black coat, you know, in certain country they even wear a special wig, uh, an old different idea. Then a policeman have a special clothes that he have to dress like a policeman to show authority. So you say, you say from here that you learn that there is certain, okay, commitment that those people have to show. You learn from here, Rabotai, that when it's come to the Kohanim, especially when it's come to Kohen Gadol, that when he look in him anywhere in his body, when he look at his body, what he wearing, that will remind him who is he serving. And who standing in front of him in the table neck or in Bet Amigdash. That means that the clothes come to remind us who we are in Pshat of the Dvarim. From here, that will answer, maybe I will touch, I usually never involve politics, but maybe tonight. I'm gonna just throw a bit of a thing. You know, many people say, tell me, why is the Haredim? They call him Haredim. I don't know why Haredim and not Datiim. What is the difference between Haredi and Dati? I don't understand. But let's may leave it. Why does Haredim have to wear a jacket, a suit, a white shirt, certain kind of a uniform, let's call them. So from here we learn Rabotai, very important lesson, that the Haredim wear it. If you call him Haredim, I call him Datim, it doesn't make a difference. That when you look at your clothes that you're wearing, that must remind us that I'm standing in front of the Almighty. That's to remind us that I'm representing certain people. The same like the Kohen Gadol in Bet Amigda have to dress with certain kind of clothes. Also here we have to stand with certain clothes. And that will answer all of those that all the time have to say something against the Haredim or the Datim. And it doesn't, to me, it doesn't make sense why they call him Haredim. Why is Dati is not a Haredi? What a difference. Haredi means Milshon Hared Ledvar Hashem. 
that everything he want to keep what Akadosh Baruch Hu tell him. So if he wear uh, uh, certain things, you must call him Haredi if he does it. Well, okay, let's leave it. I don't want to touch that. But the main important thing that it's come to tell us that many people say, why is the Datim do that? We dress like this to remind us that we're serving Akadosh Baruch Hu. We're putting a yami in our head to have Yirat Shamayim, to have the fear of heaven, to remind us that there is someone above us. And that's what we have to behave. So every person that wear a yami have to understand what's happening behind. I'm speaking for myself, not for you, you old tzaddiki. You know, when person drives, sometimes he loses his station and beep, he hoot. Why are you hooting? Remember, the keeper that you wear, if people look at you and they say, look at that religious person, it can cause Hilul Hashem. I'm speaking to myself, you all tzaddikim, you 100%. I need to work on my midot, on my, my uh, character trait. And that's what is it. That's what it's come to teach us. And now we can understand why the Torah tell us that the Quranim have to have special clothes. Let's move on. I'm going to skip because we already at quarter to nine and we're running late. I'm actually going to skip quite a bit. Uh, Louis, we're going to move to verse 30. In verse 30, in chapter 28, the Torah tell us, V'natata el hoshen, el hoshen ha-mishpat, et ha-urin, ve-et ha-tumin, ve-ayu alev Aharon, be-boho lifne Adonai, v'nasa Aharon, et mishpat b'nei Yisrael, al-libo, lifne Adonai tamid. Just hang on, Rabbi, I'm just getting to verse 30. Ah, yeah. Okay, let's go to verse 30. Chapter 28, verse 30. Oh, the chapter 28, verse 30. Oh, yes. all right. Yes. Okay. So, here we are. Okay. Into the, the breastplate of the judgment shall be placed a urim and a turim, and they shall be, off, uh, be on Aaron's heart when he, he comes before Hashem and Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel on his heart constantly before Hashem. Okay, so Hazal explaining tonight, I'm going to bring the commentary of the Ramban. The Ramban is the Nachmanite, the Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman. He born in the city of Catalonia in Spain 828 years ago. And in his commentary on the Torah, he said, that we all know that on a breastplate was 12 stone. And on the 12 stone, on each stone was engraved the name of every tribes, the tribes of Bene Israel. Okay, until here we all know. And he said like this, when the Kohen have a question and they wanted to ask in the Urim Vetumim, okay, the Urim and Tumim, it's uh, when people have a question, for example, that they wanted to know, can we go to a war? So they used to ask the Urim and Tumim, and certain letters, okay, about I focus with me, certain letters from the name of every tribe used to light, not all the name. And the Kohen Gadol, the Kohen Gadol have to have the Holy Spirit, to know how to connect the word, the letters together, and you'll get the right word, the right answer. Okay? Until here, we understand. That's the Rambam. Okay? But he said that, you know what it's mean, Urim and Tumim. So Hazal tell us in the Gemara, in Masechet Yoma, Ein Gimel Amud Bet, 73, Folio 2. Hazal say Urim. Urim shemeirim et divrehem. What it means, Urim? That the light, they words. To me, shemashlinim et divrehem. That means that it's not enough what said the Rambam from here, it's not enough that you see the light coming on every 
certain letters. For example, we know that there is Ruven, and then there is Shimon Levi. Let's say on Ruven, the Vav, the, 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 the Vav suddenly have a special life. Shimon the Shin, Levi the Yud. I'm just throwing words, okay? If those lights, you have to know in which sequence to put the letters and proper letters, okay, and proper sequence, that you will get the proper answer. So say the Ramban that the Holy Spirit, only if the Kohen have the Holy Spirit, you will know how to have the right sequence. And that's how we're going to get the right answer from heaven. And that's what it says, Urim Betumim. You know why they call Urim? Urim Milshon Or, to light. That first of all, the letter's going to be light. But to me, to me, Shemashlimim Edivim, that's mean that completed, that's mean that that's completed the sentence, that you will understand the heavenly answer from the Almighty. Okay, so now we can understand what Hazal in uh, Masechet Yoma telling us. They telling us that it's not enough that the light gonna be only shining. Come the Rambam and explain that that's what Hazal saying that the uh, Kohen Gadol have to have the Holy Spirit because sometimes the letters on certain names will light and you done if you don't have the Holy Spirit and you join them and you're quite smart, you calculate it, you'll get the name. But maybe the answer that you got if you don't have the Ruach HaKodesh, the heavenly spirit, you're not gonna get the right answer. So say the Rambam, from here you learn that the Kohen Gadol is not a simple person. What do we learn from here? that the Kohen Gadol have to have also Ruach HaKodesh. And that where the Kohen Gadol can help the Jewish people when they ask in a rim and to me, when they ask in a breastplate, they come in the front of the HaKadosh Baruch Hu and ask, for example, to go to war, not to go to a war, so he had to know how to connect the letters, how to put them in the right sequence with the heavenly spirit to get the right answer. That's the Chokmah of Urim Vatumim. And now we understand a little bit about Urim Vatumim. Uh, let's continue. In verse 35, Louis verse 35. Yeah. And there it's uh, the same. It's the, it's, this is was. Are you with me? That was verse 30. Now we're going to verse 35. In verse 35, the Torah tells us, You must be on Aaron in order to minister it. Sounds shall be heard when he enters into the sanctuary before Hashem and when he leaves so that he is not, uh, that he had not died. Okay, first of all, we have to understand what he's talking about, this verse. This verse is talking about Yom Kippur, the serving of the Kohen Gadol and Yom Kippur. What's happened? Once a year, only once a year, the Kohen Gadol can enter the Holy of Holiness to do atonement to the Jewish people, the Kodesh HaKonashim. The Holy of Holiness, it's called Kodesh HaKodeshim. What does it do there? We know that he makrit ketoret. He sacrificed, okay? The spices. The Torah tells us that in Yom Kippurim, when the Kohen Gadol served, okay? In oil moed, in a tent of meeting, no one must be there. When the Kohen Gadol walked, one thing you have to make sure that the Kohen Gadol have, that when he have, when you make his coat, you should make sure that he have bells, okay, in the bottom of the, of his coat, 
and pomegranate made from gold. Why? Hazal explained and Mefarshim explained that when the Kohen Gadol gonna walk, those bells, those pomegranate that made from gold, silver, whatever is it, will make noise. And the rest of the Kohanim that in the tabernacle immediately will move away. That they're not going to disturb the Kohen Gadol because when he entered the Holy of Holiness, he have to focus. And has Shalom that anyone will disturb him. So say, here the Torah come to teach us something very important. That you know what was the job of the bells on a coat of the Kohen Gadol is to tell everyone, listen, I'm coming. Don't disturb me. I'm coming to serve in a holy of holiness. And if there is Kohanim, okay, in oil Mu'ayyad, in a tent of meeting, they immediately mustn't show them stuff. They must disappear. Why? Because the Kohen going Gadol busy with his work on Yom Kippur. It's such a holy day that that day all depend on Avodat Kohen Gadol. Because he's doing a torment to the entire Jewish people. So the bells come to teach us an upshot of that varim rabotai that no one must be there. But it's come to teach us something very important. That if the Kohen Gadol entering where the Holy of Holiness, and when he walk, he make noise. So we say that one of our dear according to the pshat to say to the Kohanim, whoever there, move away. Listen, the Kohen Gadol walking, they can hear the noise of the bell, they'll disappear. But when you enter the Holy of Holiness, who is there? Only the Shrina, the Holy Shrina. Why are you making noise before you come? It's come to teach us Musa Rabotai, that when a person entered the Kohen Gadol entering the Holy of Holiness, he making noise that when you come to your own house, the place that you live, before you open the door of your house, knock. Hello, I'm here to teach us Musa. That if the Kohen Gadol, before he entered the Holy of Holiness, and who's there? The Holy Spirit. There's no one there. But still, you have to show respect. And when a person walk to his own house, have to do it. Kalvahomer, before you go into someone else's flat. If you're living in a block of flats, and in South Africa, it's not applicable because it's all walls, it's surrounding with walls, gate, who knows? You know, cameras, who knows what there is else? But in Israel, everyone live in a block of flats. So you can't just come and open the door for your fellow neighbor. When you go knock, learn that from the Kohen Gadol. Derech Eretz. Derech Eretz Kadma La Torah. Another idea the Mepharshim bring, that from here we learn that the Sefer Torah that we have, have on top of it bells, the pomegranate, we call them Rimonim. Why? That when a person carry the Sefer Torah, that they should check. So if someone busy reading, someone busy studying, he must hear the noise and immediately will stand up to honor the Sefer Torah. And many of the Gaboim, Rabotai, doesn't know that. What do they do, the Gaboim? They take the pomegranate and they let the thing go. No, you must leave it on the Sefer Torah because the purpose of it is those that sitting and doesn't take notice, oh, I don't want to say talking and busy China hiking, that they learn that the, they, they will hear the sound of the Sefer Torah shaking, immediately they will stand up. Immediately they will keep quiet. Why? Because we're carrying the Sefer Torah to the Echa. And that's the secret of the pomegranate that was in the bells that was on a coat of the Kohen Gadol. And from here, Hazal learned that every Sefer Torah that you carry it, that you take it out of the ark to the Bima, you must make sure that there is Rimonim on top, so it will shake. So people will stand up, people will listen, and will see the Sefer Torah and respect it with the right 
respect that the Sefer Torah deserves. That's about the pomegranate of and the bells of Kohen Gadol, and what do we learn from it, and why is he heaven? I would like now to move to the Aftarah because the time running very late. I just want to do one verse from the Aftarah. The Aftarah that we're going to read this week is the Haftar from the book of Yeheskel. The book of Yeheskel, okay, is the book of Ezekiel, okay, in chapter 43, verse 10. That's what I'm going to read, remember, and there it's like this. Ata ben Adam, haged et bet Yisrael, et abayt, v'yikalemu me'avonotihem, u'madedu et ha'tokhnit. You, Ben uh, uh, Adam, tell the house of Israel of the temple and let, it, uh, let them be ashamed of their sins and measure the design. Okay, what's happening here? We have to understand. So first of all, the prophet Yehazkel here speak about Bet HaMikdash. Now we're talking about the vessel of Bet HaMikdash, that that's called the Tebel Neko, the Mishkan. I saw a beautiful commentary of the Malbin. The Malbin was Rabbi Meir Leibush Ben Yehiel Michal Weiser. He born in the Ukraine 213 years ago. In his commentary on a prophet and prophet uh, Ezekiel Yehazkel, he explained like this, that in this verse, Akadosh Baruch Hu actually speaking directly to the prophet. And he said to the prophet, Ata ben Adam, you, the prophet, you saw, you saw the third Bet Amikdash. The third Bet Amikdash is ready. I want you to tell the children of Israel that the, the third Bet Amikdash is ready. You saw it in your own eyes. Tell the children of Israel that the third Bet Amikdash is ready to come down. And the only reason that I'm not bringing it down from heaven is because they sin. Say Kadosh Baruch Hu to Prophet Yehazkel, tell the children of Israel to do atonement, to do tshuva. And if they'll do tshuva and they refrain from doing averot, I will bring down that Bet Tamikdash that you saw in your own eyes. So we learn from here that the only time that Bet Amikdash can come down from heaven, when we do mitzvot and we stop doing averot. Not only that, when we do a toim. So say Rabbi, Rabbi Meir Leibush ben Yehiel Michal Weiser, the Malbi, that here a Kadosh Baruch Hu telling the prophet Yehazkel, if the Jewish people will do tshuva, Okay, do a toyment and doing mitzvot, and they stop doing avirot, immediately the Bet Amikdash is going to come up from heaven down to earth. And by Ezrat Hashem, that we should all merit to see, first of all, the Mashiach, because the Mashiach has to come first. And he's going to declare that the third Bet Amikdash is going to come straight from heaven, and we should merit to see the third Bet Amikdash. Speedily in our days, Amen Kenya so on, that we should all merit to see Mashiach and Bet Amikdash in our days, Amen Ken Yehir Ratzon. I would like uh, to give time for those of you that want to ask questions regarding the Parsha and I try to answer if I can. Uh, Rabot, I just one other idea, one other idea that I need to, to, to give an answer. Uh, our friend Orna, our friend Orna, when we spoke about the mother of Sarah Bat Asher, she sent me another opinion, another opinion that from Sefer Ayashar, that the name of uh, the mother of Sarah Bat Asher was a different mother than I given. So that means there is two opinions in the Mefarshim. The one opinion is that it, Asher have only one wife. The other opinion have that a share from his first wife, he didn't have kids and she died. Then he married another woman 
and from the second wife, okay, he have Sarah bat Asher, but she have other kids from her first husband. So from here we see that there is two different opinions in the Mepharshim. Who was the mother of Serah Batashir? I just wanted to share it with you. By the way, Orna, thank you very much. Um, any question regarding the Pasha? Bechabod. Hello, it's Anthony. How are you? Baruch Hashem. Antonio, how are you? All right, thanks. <clears throat> it says in 28 verse 1, the sons of Aaron, and it mentions their names. Why doesn't the Torah yeah. just say the sons of Aaron without mentioning their names? Why does it have to mention their names? Okay, very good, very good question. And there it says, Nadav ve'avihu el'azar ve'itamar. Okay. Yes. First of all, you have to understand that not every children of Kohen Gadol in that time can become Kohen Gadol. They become Kohen Gadol not because their father was Kohen, like you, your father was a Kohen, and you take the priestly after him, Nahon? Yes. In a time, in a time, in a time of the table nickel, who was Aaron? Aaron was a Levi. Nahon? Yes. Okay, because Aaron was the brother of Moshe. Nahon? Who was their father? Amram. And there was the cat. So it's tell you here, it's not automatically in those days that the kids get the priestly. Why? Because they're already born. So they live uh, in, if they're born, they don't get it immediately. When do they get it immediately? Only after the father become a Kohen. And when he have a kids later on, they receive it automatically. But here, Aaron was already a lady. And the kids was already Levim. Why? Because they was alive. They're born before they become a priest. So the Torah have to tell us that Nachon that they was Levim, but now Akadosh Baruch Hu command that Aaron going to become a, a priest, higher priest, Kohen Gadol, and his kids going to take the title to become priestly. Otherwise, we wouldn't know because we would think that certain. Another answer Banab, which one of his son are the Kohanim? He have four sons. Which one of them? You understand? Yes. Yes, can you? yes thanks very the much. With pleasure, with pleasure. Any other question, Robotai? Any other question? Who want to ask question? Bechabot. Good evening, Rav. <laughs> Good evening. How are you, Jeffrey? It's always nice to see How are you no. doing? Ah, oh, Baruch Hashem. Can't complain. All oh, good. Thank you. Kol tov. Kol tov, Baruch Hashem. And Baruch it's nice Hashem, seeing you again. <laughs> nice seeing you. Rav, the, 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 there was there's so many interesting aspects of, on this, what you've explained. The one which... which uh, entices me, which makes me think and which I'd like to share. And maybe you can, can, I'd like your comment on it. It says that we were discussing the Chazal, that's the first, that we, it says that the first drop of the olive, the, the very first drop, the first press of the, when you press it, the, the, the first drop. It, so that's, that's the drop that you use to light. Now, you mentioned that the oil came from heaven. Now, if the oil came from heaven, and you quite rightly said, how can you use something that's come from heaven and what have you? Perhaps, just perhaps, they should never send the oil. He sent the olives. And it was up to the people to do the pressing so that they should get the first drop. So, so that they will know when they enter the land they have to do the pressing and they, and they have to get the first drop of oil. Maybe, I don't know. It's, okay, so, so, um, it so mention, I'll say it mentions the man coming, but doesn't mention oil coming down. So, no, it doesn't mention, doesn't mention anything. Where is it mentioned? Yeah. So, if you look at Yonatan bin Oziel, Yonatan bin Oziel, in every, almost every homage, there is a commentary of him. And he said this. In a Targum, they explain that you know where is that 
all olive oil came, he said, Mishamayim. What does it mean, Mishamayim? That the olive oil that they got came from Shamayim. So the olive oil itself came from heaven. He doesn't say that the Zetim came from Shamayim. Is that mean? He doesn't say that the olive came. He said olive oil. The olive oil that came from heaven with that the lighting the menorah. So That's how, how we know, know that the olive oil came from heaven, not the olive. You follow? Yes. Jeff. So how would you know it's the first pressing? Because okay. you, how the olive oil how came how down. We know it's the first pressing. So you know how is Masechet Avot start? Very good question. You're asking a beautiful question. Masechet Avot starts like this. Moshe kibel Torah Mesinai. Yes. Moshe received the Torah yes. from Sinai. Wait. Moshe was up in heaven. What do you tell me in Sinai? He received the Torah in heaven. Moshe was up in heaven three times, we explain, for 40 days. But what it means, Moshe kibel Torah misinai, Torah misinai. That the Torah that we have, we have the written Torah and we have the oral Torah. What is the oral Torah and what is the written Torah? The homage that we're reading, the five book of Moses, that's Torah shebikhtav, the written Torah. Torah shebaal peh, the Mishnayot, the Gemarot, Okay, all the commentaries that we have, that our sages wrote, the commentaries, that's Torah Shabbal Peh. Moshe Rabbeinu received it all where? A man Sinai. He passed it to Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai, Msara Yeshua. Yeshua Msara Liskini, Nahon? And on and on and on. Skini, Msara Wali and Sheikh Nestak Dola. What is it that Hazal here tell us that the history, how we received the Torah? Akadosh Baruch Hu given the Torah, the written Torah and the oral Torah to Moshe. Moshe passed it to Yeshua. Yeshua passed it to the elderly. You understand? And they told all of that commentary. Now we explain that when Rashi, for example, Rashi Akadosh wrote commentary on the Torah, he fasted 365 days before he wrote his commentary on the Torah. That means to write commentary on the Torah, you have to have the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We explained that Rabbi Yaakov Baal Aturim, that he wrote his commentary on all the five books of Moses. It was in one night. How can you write so much commentary? Even if you sit and you write, you'll never finish. <laughs> it's have to have a shba'at kulmus. Hazal call it Ashba'at Kolmus. Kolmus is a pen. In daytime, they didn't have a pen. They have like a feather. So they used to have Ashba'at Kolmus. Whatever he had in mind, he told the Kolmus, you know, the Ingdals, I don't know how you call it, like Kolmus, it's what the Sofer write, the, the, the Sefer Torah, what he write, the Mezuzah, the Tefillin. I don't know how you call it in English, that special feather. A, a scrub, a special... Ma maybe a, a quill, quill. A quill. quill. A, a quill. A quill. A quill. He, he, Hazal said that he made the Shba'at Kolmus. He took an oat, okay? And he have to write. Whatever he think, whatever he said, the Kolmus work by himself. Write by himself. It's beyond understanding. Yeah. So the commentary that come, and here we brought Yonatan ben Oziel. Yonatan ben Oziel, listen what Hazal tell us. When Yonatan ben Oziel used to sit and study Torah, was a fire from his head to the heaven. And if a bird gone through that fire, she burned himself. He burned it. Hillel was he is, was he his rabbi? He burned the, the bird that fly in the air. He lay, he used to actually bring her life, he used to cure her. So you're talking about people that have direct line to heaven. That's mean, Yonatan ben Oziel, that when he used to study, 
the fire used to go from his head direct to heaven. He have all the direct knowledge coming to his brain. We don't understand that. So Hazal and Gemara say that he have such a direct line that he was so focusing that the holiness was like a fire, like a pillow of fire from him to the heaven. So if he wrote in a commentary, there was oil. <laughs> <I> guess, <laughs> okay, you accept it. <laughs> I think that, I think that we, we know what. Yes. I have a strong question. The Chavod. When, I, when we read the parasha, we see like Hashem give the, 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 the color of the clothes also. But why they not give the responsibility also with the children of Moses? I mean, like we see like Aaron must be with their kids, but Moses with their kids, the kids, they never talk about that, their child. That's my question now. Very good. Because there's a difference between a priest between a priest that is the highly, highly priest, you know, he served better Middash. That you receive from heaven. Moshe Rabbeinu, what was his job? Moshe Rabbeinu's job was to teach Torah. He was the king of Israel. He taught the Jewish people the entire Torah. The Torah come and teach us something very important, a very important principle. Listen to that, Isaacs. That Torah, it doesn't mean if I'm a rabbi, my son will be a rabbi. It doesn't mean if I'm, I'm a tzaddik, my son will be a tzaddik. The Torah tells us Moshe Rabbeinu reached to the higher level of spirituality because he worked on it. After that, who been chosen to be number two? Yeshua. Why? Because Yeshua worked on his character trait. He served Moshe Rabbeinu. That means that the children of Moshe Rabbeinu may, may be, I'm sure that there was great righteous people, but they didn't work enough to take the title. Title of being a rabbi, being a lecturer, being a, a person that can pass Torah, that means a scholar person, not everyone can get it. You have to work on it yourself. Moshe worked on it himself. He deserved it. He got it. The Torah tells us, Moshe Rabbeinu is our rabbi. His kids didn't reach to that level. The Torah doesn't give him that title. Who got that title? Yeshua Abinun. Because he worked on that. And that's the difference between priestly and Keter Torah. Hazal in a Mishnah in, in Masechet Avot say, there is three kinds of a crown that a person can have. Keter Keuna, the crown of priestly. Keter Malchut, the crown of the king. Okay? And Hazal say that there is a Keter Torah, that the person that He's a scholar person, people given him. What does it mean? That the person has to work on himself to study Torah, to put a lot of effort on it, and then he will get that crown. If you're not going to work on it, don't think, <clears throat> don't, don't think that it will be a heritage. In the Torah, there is no heritage. The Torah work, how much effort you put. And if you want to become a scholar person, you have to study. You have to work hard. Sorry, <clears throat> my throat got dry. So it's come to teach you that the main reason that the children of Moshe never been mentioned, that they took any title, because they didn't work hard enough and they didn't fulfill their potential. You follow, that's the difference. And the signification of the, the color, oh, I see, it. I, when I read the, the Pasha, I saw they give three color, purple, 
blue and the yellow, I think, gold, gold color for the the, oh, the for the, the, the uniform for the, the clothes of uh, the uh, you're talking about the special uniform that the Kohen Gadol have to wear. Yes. Trelet Vargaman. Okay. Color. Those, okay, those color, they have a special color. Trelet represent the heaven. That when the Kohen Gadol wear it, he have to remember the heaven who's sitting in heaven to remind them the heaven. And the Ariya Kadosh, Rabbi Tzhak Luri Ashkenazi say that a person should look at the heaven all day. Why? Because the heaven bring you to have a fear of heaven. This is special about that color. The Adam Efarshim explain that the color of the heaven, it's a baby blue. It's against the evil eye. That sometimes you see people wear it, especially in Israel, they're selling you all of those garments, uh, I mean, um, what do you call it? Um, like, uh, like uh, I don't know how to call it. I really don't know. It's like a string Anything that you put with all different, sorry? Bracelet. Yeah, a bracelet, whatever you want to call it. But they have like blue, um, I don't know, blue plastic things on it, like eyes to symbol against the evil eye. Okay. And then there is, uh, the, there is the Seva Sagol. Sagol is a purple that represent, obviously, you know, it represent there the, the, the part that become, that from that they make the, you know, the trellet. Okay, there is a special hilazon that they make the trellet and all of that. You follow? So it's to symbol certain things that, number one, strength, modesty, all of those coming together that you have to put yourself, that you have to be very strong, but from the other way, you have to be very modest. You follow? Thank you. Robert. Any other question? Yeah, yes, thank you more. so much. Hello? Uh, one more, Rabbi? Can I sure, ask sure, sure. Question? Bechabot. Um, Yecheskel was shown the base of Mikdash that was supposed to yes. come down. He was supposed to, no. this is the base of Mikdash that's going to come, and it's going to come down, but it can't come now because the Jews, we've not atoned yet. We, we haven't atoned. Here we are now in 2022, in 5782, we haven't atoned. In fact, we are, the people are splitting more and more away from atonement. Now, here we are waiting and we're saying, we want Mashiach to come, we want Mashiach to come. How on earth can we keep saying, of course we must look forward and we want Mashiach to come. But because those of us that want, we, we, we feel it. We want, we want it to come. But in truth, we're not fortune tellers, but you don't have to be a genius to know that we're not going to repent. They're not going to repent. The people are going to turn. There's still going to be the divide. So we 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 were told, or I've learned, or I've, I've from somewhere by the year seven thousand, it's going to come anyway. The the, the base of Mikdash is going to come down anyway. So my question is, if it is going to come down anyway, what what is there for the people that don't believe or people that don't wish to atone? What, what is the what is the um, uh, the magic wand for them to do it? I mean, <laughs> it's quite. A, there's no incentive. To, there's no incentive so, to attack. So Hazal say in a Gemara that how the Mashiach come because, like you saying, there's certain people don't want to do tshuva, and we see what's happening in the world at the moment. That chutzpah yazge, that cheekiness before the Mashiach come will be extremely. Okay, mehir ayin yamir, the price of wine gonna be extremely. We see the prices all over the world, extremely. Yeah. You can't believe everything become very expensive. Hazal say yamid ale melech. In a Gemara, Hazal say yamid ale melech kashek yaman. 
if Bnei Israel not going to do it himself, Akadosh Baruch Hu going to send yeah. a king that is so evil, like Haman Rasha, and he going to put such a decree that going to force them to do tshuva. Okay, now for your second question, because you basically ask two questions regarding yeah. the seven thousand, the year seven thousand. The year 7,000 actually represent the time Bashar. We, number seven, you remember we don't show about it. Yes. Seven represent above nature, okay? Yes. Eight, no, what eight is you said above nature. So, sorry, eight above nature. Seven is that when, when you take like uh, Shabbos, when you take Shanash Ve'it, that you have to stop, rest. That's mean that in those years, we're gonna have like a peaceful year. But the Shanash Minit, that Olam HaNeshamot above nature, we understand the world of soul, there's no more body. So now what does that have to do? We have to understand that people wanna enjoy to see Mashiach now. What is the chokhmah to wait until the 7,000? We want the Mashiach now. We don't want the Taurus. So if we, if we want to have now peace, tranquility in a world, that all the world, I'm not talking about Jewish, I'm talking about all the world, going to live in peace one with each other. Not every second day put it aside that he's going to declare war. Now, America, Europe, United Nations, they're all in a, in a chaos. What's going to happen in the world? It's not going to be anymore. Peace and harmony. That means that every person can live, can live one next to each other. That means that a wolf and a sheep can live together. Mm. That the world going to come back to what it started before the sins of Adam Arishon. And that's what we want. But the mystical rabbi, I tell you where you hear it. You obviously learn one of your shorim that, uh, that speak about it. And I know that you love Chabad. So in one of the shorim, they explain to you that Bashana Shvei, the 7,000, no matter what, the Mashiach have to come. Nahon? That's what you hear. Yeah. Yes, but we have to ask why do we have to wait until the 7,000 to suffer? We want it now, we want we have enough suffering in the world. How many Jews been murdered? How many Jews been annihilated for nothing, for doing nothing, just because they're Jews? We have to ask the Mashiach to come, we don't want it anymore. So, why to wait for the year 2000? How many more are gonna die? You understand? Okay, Rabbi. So let's just take that one step further. Here okay. we are. And you mentioned we perhaps can be forced to do it from a king. Well, we're being forced to look to Hashem now all over the world with the anti Semitism which is going on. We are forced, we are being forced. You think it's you think it's the people doing it? It's been there forever, but it's been intensified. We are being forced to look to see who we are and where we're coming from. Perhaps this anti-Semitism, which is a terrible thing, is what is meant to be in order for us to look to where we're supposed to be looking. Pashut, Pashut. Why is it Pashut? Look, Akadosh Baruch Hu given us the festival of Purim. Why did he give us the festival of Purim? Because it was a decree according to the Pshat of the Dvarim, Haman Rasha wanted to kill the Jewish people. Nahon, we know yeah. him, he done a deal with the Hashverosh. He was <clears throat> a descendant of Amalek. They done a business deal. They wanted to destroy. But here we see something else. Akadosh Baruch Hu tell us, look, in a time of Haman Rasha, the Jewish people pro make a proper atonement, I save them all. You do the same, I will save you all. Do you understand? The messages is all over the world. Wherever you walk, yeah. just read the messages yeah. on the wall. Now I want to ask you something. 
according to Jewish religion, homosexuality is a something yareg. Oh. That means the punishment is dead. Nahon? Yes. 15, 20 years ago, did you ever hear about such thing? People speaking about it, marching? Never was. People was inside yeah, the gay pride marches. Yeah. That never was exist. The Zohar mm -hmm. said before the Mashiach come, all of the people, and I mentioned it before, all of the people that was during the flood time, during the uh, door of the Palaga, the door Marvel, of yeah. Zdom, all of those generation, that mean flood, the Tower of Babel and Zdom will come back. Akadosh Baruch Hu going to give them another chance to rectify their deeds. They're not going to rectify it. They're going to lose their time. They lose the boat. Final. They're giving them a final chance to jump on a boat. You don't want to jump on a boat. You don't want to do a tournament. You lose the boat. What's going to happen after that? Hashbonot Shamayim, we don't know. And that's the final. That's the final. Now you see the final. You see the corruption all over the world. I'm not talking only about South Africa. I'm talking about all over the world. You can see the double standard in the world against poverty. It's all a lie. Yeah. It's all a lie. All the nation in the world, how much money they put putting to themselves. United Nations, the biggest crook in the world. The biggest anti-Semitism. That's what it's about. They're giving him a chance. I'm afraid you're breaking up, brother. You follow? That's what I'm saying. Rav, can I just say something? The Bravo, Dr. Les, we waited okay. for you. Wow. No, so I'll just mention something that you mentioned about, it was a very good question about with, uh, with Moshe's sons, why, why didn't they take over? So something very interesting, in the, in the Mir Yeshiva, um, when, um, when the Rosh Yeshiva was, uh, they needed a new successor, when he was, you know, he, was, um, he wasn't well enough to continue, so he saw his, um, it was his, his nephew, Nev Nosson Sri, who actually was a boy who grew up in America playing basketball. And he came to the yeshiva. He came from a very um, American background. And he came to the yeshiva and he asked his mother, he wants him to spend a year with him. And he came to the yeshiva and he saw such potential in this boy, Nosson Sri. And he made him the Rosh Yeshiva. And what was amazing about the mirror is that, you know, his own children, his own more close direct descendants could have protested and said, well, we have the right to be the Rosh Hashiva. But when, when the Rosh Hashiva decided that Nusen Sri would take over, it was unanimous and people agreed. And that is why I think the mirror is the greatest, it is the, the biggest and the largest and the most important yeshiva in the world because it's got such act to it. Because people saw um, and they respected his uh, his choice, and Nosson Sri really was the, the he was the man because he actually built up that yeshiva. He was so passionate about um, bringing everybody into the yeshiva, and he built it up today to be the the most important yeshiva in the world. And it's because of the actors. So that's exactly what you were saying, Rav. Uh, it, it's, we see it. We see it today. It it, it actually did happen. And it How continues to thrive. Yeah, yeah, How he built it up. You, you, you go there today. You see what, what, what he only achieved. His, his, his passion for, for, for bringing Bokrim, all different types. You have Hasidim, you have Litvish, you have everybody there, all learning Torah, all united. And uh, it's just unbelievable. And it's because mm -hmm. everybody, like, uh, you know, they're all united for the, the sake of Torah. Uh -huh. That's the kiru. That's the idea about kiru. That's what we all speaking about it all year. To yeah. make karev the rechokim. So think about that basketball player. 
okay? He might gonna be the best basketball player in the world, but he's not gonna be the mayor, a rebbe. When he change yeah. from a basketball player, he become the mayor of rebbe. Yeah. And that's, that's to teach us that every person have a potential. Torah, everyone can get it, but you have to work on it. Torah, you don't receive. Okay, I study Torah. And I put effort and I study. My son, how's he going to get that Torah? Only if I teach him, only if he work on it, only if he want it. But if he doesn't yeah. want it, he can't inherit it. To inherit Torah, you have to study it. Without studying Torah, you can't get it. So I just want to mention, uh, on Monday night, there was Baruch Tenza and Andy, they, uh, their daughter's wedding. Oh, Can you shall like? it, was unbel- it was unbelievable. Here we saw, oy, it was like a South African reunion. It was just the most amazing <laughs> simcha. It was phenomenal. I'll send you maybe some videos from the wedding, but it was absolutely unbelievable. And, uh, and it was just, it was such a, it was amazing. It was really special. It's a beautiful news. It's yeah. good news to hear. I'm so happy to hear it. It's mamish good news. Mamish. I'm it so was happy. such simcha. It was, it was incredible. It was, it was such, it was wonderful being there. No, Baruch Hashem. Okay. I'm so happy. Koyak, Rav. Koyak. Okay, guys. Any more questions? No. Okay. So I would like to wish all of you a great Shabbos. Yes, Jeffrey, you wanted to ask? No, no, I just just wish you good Shabbos. I'm muted. Thank you. But to wish everyone Shabbat Shalom and Vorechet. Enjoy the beautiful Shabbos. Enjoy every moment of this Shabbos. Because Shabbat Tetzaveh, Rabotai, it's not only just speaking. It's speaking about Rabotai, the or what it means, the all, the lights. And by Ezrat Hashem, that we should all merit to see the light of the Mashiach speedily oh in our day. Amen. We should all Shabbat Shalom. Have a great evening. All the best. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. All the best.